Engineering. We help organize this seminar each term. Um, for those of you who don't know, we also webcast the seminar, which means we are live on the web right now with a few people at least out there watching us. We also archive all of the seminars so you can watch them in the future. Um, because we do webcast the seminars and people are watching on the web, when we get to the point when our speaker is going to be taking questions, uh, we need you to use the microphones. On most of your desks, there is a microphone glued to the desk. There's an area that says touch. You need to hold the touch button down, keep the red light lit while you are asking your question. Um, if you don't have a microphone on your desk or if it's not working, we have this portable one that we're going to come around and use. I think today we are going to do some introductions around the room since it's the beginning of the term and those of you who are taking this as a class, you're a student, I'm, we're all learning your names and who you are. Um, so it's going to be useful, also useful to our speaker to know who our audience is. Um, so before I introduce the speaker, I think we'll go around and do introductions. I'm also going to send around the sign-in sheet for the students who are enrolled as a class. Um, so the key thing is wherever this ends up, please get it back to me back in the corner, um, either myself or one of my colleagues back in the corner. So that is your task and your assignment for the day. Um, so I'm going to start it over here. Um, for students and um, let's start our introductions here and this is your time to practice using the microphone as well. Michelle Van Tyne, second year Merck. Oh, the, down here where it says touch. <laughs> oh, maybe it's not working. Okay, go on then. Catherine Morrow, I work in the Office of International Affairs, Institute for Asian Studies. I'm also um, very involved with Portland's Ulsan sister city in Korea. Oh, okay. Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Seun Young Ho. Mm, I'm from Korea. Oh, great. Welcome. Rasha Cronin, Civil Environmental Engineering Master's Program. Jennifer Gillenwater, Civil Environmental Engineering Master's Program. Shi uh, Yang, a first year master in MUS program. Mm, Hui Fu uh, from China Academy of Urban Planning and Design. Chrissy Hostetler, second year MERP. I work in international affairs and I'm also a MERP. James Offsink, I'm a staff member here at PSU. Uh, Stacia Honnold, random spectator. Uh, Colin Routon, first year MERP. <coughs> Lisa Cox, Lisa Cox. Katie Yuri, <coughs> Willamette Pedestrian Coalition. I'm Roger Averbeck. I serve on both the City of Portland's and the Multnomah County's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committees. I'm Oliver Smith from the Urban Studies PhD program. Marielle Brown, second year MERP. Nick Falbo, second year MERP. Kyung Kim, PhD student in Urban Studies and Planning. Josh Roll, Lane Council of Governments. Song Moon Gwan, uh, I'm a PhD student in Urban Studies. April Cutter, second year MERP. Will Farley, civil engineering grad student. Um, let me get the microphone back. We'll go up this side. Al Klein, daily bike commuter. Miguel Figliasi, Civil Engineering Faculty. John Gleeby, Urban Studies and Planning Faculty. Scott Kelly, Civil Engineer. Uh, Ryan Gratzer, Staff in Center for Transportation Studies. No. Jia Hong, Postdoctor in PSU China Program. Chris Moose, uh, grad student in civil engineering. Steve Jarvis, grad student, Emmy. Barbara Linson, uh, MERP alumni. And I'm Brian Davis, graduate student in civil engineering. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to take my portable mic back. And uh, without further ado, 
uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, we're very pleased today to have Tara Goddard with us. She is the Bicycle and Pedestrian uh, Program Manager for the City of Davis, um, a city that I spent some time in as an undergraduate student. Um, she also graduated with a master's degree in Transportation Technology and Policy um, from UC Davis um, and then went on to become the um, coordinator for the City of Davis, uh, which is a city, as most of you probably know, has a lot of people bicycling. Um, though she's going to tell us um, about what she learned um, in another city many, many miles away um, in Korea recently. So come on up, Tara. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, let's see. Usually I take, I ask to take questions all the way through, but it sounds like maybe that's a little I awkward. Okay. Okay, so please ask questions throughout if you want, just raise your hand or whatever and make sure you use your mic. Um, let's just make sure. Okay. So as Jennifer said, my name is Tara Goddard. I'm with the City of Davis and I did graduate from UC Davis and in between there I worked for the City of Sacramento as a transportation planner as well. And the reason that I got to go to South Korea in October was they're a sister city of ours. Davis has seven sister cities and I just found out that Portland I believe has nine. And is it Ulsan? Is that Ulsan, um, South Korea? I saw that was really cool. I'll actually show everybody on the map in case you didn't already know where that is. Um, some of our sister cities, we have more active relationships than others. And Sanju, we have a really active relationship with. And we send a delegation every year, pretty much. And we've been sister cities since 2004. And then they send a delegation to us. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I'm also going to talk about the stats um, and why Sanju is the bicycle city of Korea and why we went there. Oh, oh, how do I get that off? Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, for those of you that might not be that familiar with South Korea, and I wasn't before I got to go on this trip, here's a map of South Korea, and Seoul is up here. And then this is the region where Sanju city is. And then Sanju is right down here, so it's in this part of it. And then Ulsan is right here. So now you guys know where your sister city is. And the, the way that they're laid out is very different than we think of cities, or at least where I am in Davis. They're, as I'll talk about in a second, their cities are divided, and I'm sure you could probably explain it a lot better than I could. They have much uh, more layers of the way they split up their governments. And also their, their cities are the city limits are very large, even though the populations might not be. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I'm also going to show a couple pictures from Pohang, which is right about here. And that's a big city on the coast, So just so you know. Oh, and then the name Sam, ba Sam Bake, right? Is that how you pronounce it? Um, is stands for, or it's, it means the three whites. And Sanju is known for its dried persimmons, its um, silkworm, and it's uh, rice, so that's where the name came, comes from. And one thing I do want to apologize for, the trip came together really quickly, and I did not have much time to learn any Korean. Um, I've never traveled somewhere and known so little of the language, which I kind of felt bad, So, if, and feel free to correct me on pronunciation. OK, so a little bit about Sanju and why it's the bike city. Um, it's much closer to Davis in population than Portland, so it's, it's a fairly small. Um, city as far as population, but if if you jump down, let's see where is it. I skip one. It's it's huge. The the city limits are huge. It's much more analogous to um, the county where Davis is. So it's as if it included that whole. Well, I live in Yolo County. I'm not sure about the size of Multnomah, but um, so people are much more spread out, and the whole city is made up of little pockets of urban areas. And then it's all ag fields in between. It's very agricultural. Much I don't know if anybody has been to Davis or Yolo County. It's very agricultural. So it's similar in that way. But things are much more spread out than, than we think of as a city, although they do have a downtown that feels quite urban because it's high rises. So even though it has a really low population, and in the US there's not many 110,000 population places that are you know urban feeling, but single family home development like we have in the US is just not something that they have there. I mean, almost everyone lives in apartments and that'll come up again later. See the car ownership? I couldn't find, this is now, I couldn't find historical data, but I, I would guess that that's actually much higher than it was even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Although Korea is the home of um, uh, Hyundai, thank you. 
and so you see you know everyone drives Hyundai's um, their bike mode share they cite as 21 percent and I put up Davis and Portland just in case you weren't familiar although like Davis and Portland it's it's very approximate like us they aren't they're struggling to figure out how to measure it and it, you know that's another question they have more like journey to work statistics like we have here but they don't have a good count for how many but that's that seems like a good estimate I mean when you're there it feels like that many people are riding bikes and I'll talk a little bit more about the demographics and how it's split and then they actually have a much more ambitious mode share goal than either Davis or Portland who both share the 25 percent mode share goal which I thought was really interesting Korea as a whole and Sanju City in, in, is one of them, one of the cities in particular that's really focused on greening their city and they have some cool stuff if you want to do a search online for the different things they're doing outside of just transportation. Um, this is just our part of our delegation and then that's the mayor, Where's this is the mayor and city administrators and one of the things that I found to be very true about South Korea is everything that they say about hospitality there was true. I mean, they were incredibly gracious. They take the sister city thing very, very seriously. And so they kind of rolled out the red carpet and we got to meet with the mayor and the city council. They have a, I believe it's 16 person city council, which if you've ever had to deal with a city council, that's just, I mean, in Davis we have five and that's, that's a lot. So um, this I have to share because I just thought it was so cool. I got honorary citizenship from the mayor in Sanju City. Um, one of the things that we did, we took with our group uh, school children from Davis. Each year we send some and they send some back. And then in, while we were there, and I'm not really, I don't have time to talk about this, but while we were there is the World University Equestrian Championship. This was a big deal. Like uh, 18 or 19 countries sent university students to participate. And it was just, I mean, everything in town was kind of dedicated to this going on. But we were at the event. And these, in addition to the Davis kids, are the homestay kids. That's what they called themselves and we called them and there were so many families that wanted to host the Davis kids that they actually had to move halfway through the week so that more families could have them it was it was pretty amazing and the kids were our kids and I think most of them were between fourth and sixth grade so they were fairly young for such I mean that's a big trip I think um, but they had a great time it was a lot of fun it was also like herding cats to get anywhere and then the other picture is just us at a dried persimmon farm. Like I said, Sanju's famous for its persimmons. And one thing is they, they uh, peel each persimmon, and there's these women who are just ancient, and they're so fast hand-peeling these. And then they have to be hand-strung by the stems, and they create these huge garlands, and then it's like an airplane hanger, you know, of these dried persimmons, and it's, it's pretty amazing. And then rather than... Um, composting or throwing away the peels, they feed them to the local beef, which makes the local beef, if you're omnivorous, uh, amazing. Like, it's, th they're famous for their beef. Okay, so bicycles. Um, <laughs> I, t I uh, told Michelle, I didn't want this to feel like I was showing my vacation slides, but I also wanted to show you some of the other things other than just bikes on the trip. So, like Davis, um, Sanju has a bicycle museum. Um, it's, it's called the Sanju Bicycles Museum, but really is the national uh, bike museum there. This is a purpose-built facility to open the day we arrived. It's an absolutely beautiful three-story or th yeah three-floor facility. Um, bike paths leading from the surrounding countryside to it and in the bottom floor they have a bike rental um, shop with you walk in and there's tons and tons of uh, bicycles this big with training wheels so a lot of families come and it's it's really neat so I'll show you some of the insides. If you can see, I know it's a little hard to see, that's a detail of one of the light fixtures. Everything there, every little detail was done with the bike in mind. It's, it was really cool. So here's the inside. This is the lobby. Oh, one lesson that I would like to impart. If you're going on a trip like this with fact-finding, take your best camera. I took my crappy little point and shoot and I regret it. So I'm sorry about the quality of some of the photos. But everything in here, it's done out in a wheel shape. The light fixtures are look like wheels and spokes. It's, it's really neat. This is the lobby. And then we took over um, to, they're going to put up a small Davis display in their bike museum. We took over a bicycle made by Peter Wagner of Davis. Some of you may be familiar with his whimsicals. Some of you have probably ridden his crazy contraptions. Um, but I guess I didn't put a picture in here, but the mayor actually got on this. And this does not have pedals. You um, bounce it to 
propel it, and he was so game. He was hilarious in his ceremonial robes and everything. So this is a view looking out from the Bicycle Museum. Again, everything kind of in the wheel and spoke um, design, beautiful plaza. This is the countryside. If you're not familiar with South Korea, it's very, very hilly. So all the urban areas are kind of just valley pockets, and it's very lush. This is a bridge looking out. Whoops, sorry about my mouse work here. This is a bridge across, and there's these huge, like they were probably 20 feet tall um, bike sculptures, like a man on a bike, and there was, they were maybe every 30, 40 feet along this bridge on both sides. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty cool. This is our superintendent of schools went with us. Davis just has the one public school district, and he came um, with the kids and got to meet all their kind of school administrators. This is more of the museum. They had really cool kind of innovative displays that had everything from antique bikes to um, research people are doing on funky, interesting bikes. This was a, a really neat vertical display. It's definitely, if, if you've ever seen the, the Bike Museum in Davis, we have an incredible collection, but we don't yet have a good facility or great display, so I was super jealous. Um, this, they had a bunch of areas with interactive things, which were cool, because they're really trying to you know, promote the bike. And so on these, I'm facing a wall that the more you pedal, the more it lights up, and there's like little flowers and bugs and things that light up. It was pretty cool. And then this is, where did my mouse go? Oh, uh, when you spin, you can't see it because it's moving. There's a pedal, there's a crank on this. And the faster you pedal it with your hand, the more pieces of the bike light up. And this is actually, he was the videographer for the mayor, but he had to stop and play because it was really fun. Um, again, lots of kid-oriented stuff in the museum as well as elsewhere. You know, a lot of the same basic rules that we're trying to teach kids, like not using your headphones and, you know, using the crosswalk and signaling your turns. And this is a really neat program. This is, if you can read that, it says Bicycle Driver's License. So they have a program um, that you have to do safety courses, things like that. We do bike rodeos. I don't know if you guys, do you guys do bike rodeos here in schools? Kids do skills course. This is a much expanded version of that. And then they actually get a license. And they've had, I think they said 4,500 people to date, kids and adults, have gone through this. So I just think that's another neat way of promoting bicyclists. And, you know, you think about with cars, we put people through at least some training and requirements. And then on bikes, we just send them out and hope they figure it out. This is uh, one of the grade schools we went to. This is probably a third of the bicycles that were parked. If you, there was equal amount to either direction. So there was hundreds or maybe over a thousand bicycles at this school and a huge percentage of kids ride to school there. Something, it's hard to tell in the picture, but these are folding bikes. And I asked about that because in the US, folding bikes tend to be kind of a luxury item. And I saw that most of the students in particular um, ride folding bikes, and they were all over Sandview. And I asked, and they said, because there aren't single family homes, because everybody lives in apartments, space is so limited that everybody has to have folding bikes so they can fold them up and you know, put them in the hallway or whatever. And then because they're manufactured nearby, they're not as expensive. So. And this is just typical school kid we saw everywhere we went, tons and tons of kids. Not that I want to get into it, but I, I'm not sure I saw any helmets in my time there, I don't think. Um, but fairly young kids, I mean, she's not particularly young, but there were fairly young kids getting out uh, or out and about by themselves. And one thing that I thought was really interesting is we were out probably 1030 or 11 at night downtown, and all of a sudden there's just hundreds of kids, like fairly, you know, kind of this age. And I asked about this, what are all these kids doing? And they were just getting out of school. So, so many kids do their schooling, and then they do after school math academy, and then they do English academy or do whatever. So they were, and you know, they were around town after dark, downtown, going home by bike. Okay, so this is the other end of the spectrum. And I said young at heart, kind of being PC, but the, the people in Korea that were the biggest, I'd say part of the mode chair were the elderly. And when I say elderly, I mean 70s and 80s. It was really amazing because you don't see a lot of that here. In fact, I saw very few people, I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, but I saw very few people kind of middle, in their middle age. Um, whereas, you know, in the U.S. it tends to be the opposite. We get a lot of people who, they're the people who have the luxury of maybe a job that's more flexible or the money to afford the equipment, things like that. I saw very few kind of middle-aged business people riding at all. It was, it was kids and then it was 
the elderly and they were i mean they rode everywhere this is a busy market you can see tons of people just kind of riding around this woman was not quite sure why i was taking her picture um, i'm really shy about taking people's pictures and so that's something that you kind of have to overcome if you want to you know, if you want to be able to take pictures back with you um, but i asked about here's a few more i don't know if you guys can see but this guy had slung uh, his foot's in a cast and he had put one crutch on each handlebar and then his kids on the back um, this is kind of the typical thing, and then this woman's riding from a persimmon market. I asked about whether they do specific outreach, you know, to the elderly community to get them riding bikes, and first of all, they thought that was kind of crazy. They didn't even understand it, what I was asking at first. But also, um, this generation, they didn't own cars. They couldn't afford to own cars, and so the bike was a way of life, and then they just kept that as they've gotten older, whether they still can't afford it or, you know, now they're old too, like gotten too far where they don't want or can't drive um, but it was it was pretty amazing and I think we have a lot to learn from that um, and also used to see their health and longevity I mean the the kind of fitness level of people into their 80s there was amazing like Davis and uh, Portland Sanju is fiercely proud of its kind of bike identity its bike culture this is a beautiful statue um, along the Nakdong River, runs through the middle of Sanju, and this is on one side of it along their bike paths, which you're going to see in a minute. This is on just on the opposite side of the river. This, I couldn't get a, a good enough picture that would show up. This lights up at night. This whole thing is colored, and it's really quite beautiful. And this is actually taken from the Bike Museum, but I just like the example. Even their drain grates or their, gu their gutter covers were really cool, and, you know, we're all about the bicycle. So bike parking, I don't know, some of you may work on this. I'm not sure. This is of big interest to me because I do it so much in Davis, you know, because it's not just the facilities to get you places. You want to be assured that you have somewhere secure to park when you get to the end. Um, Sanju had bike parking all through downtown, much like we do in Davis, but they mostly use these old racks, which are not something that, that I, you know, I would use or that we use in Davis and I don't think in Portland. Um, because they're, I call them wheel benders. So in some more pictures, you'll see a lot of bikes get knocked over very easily because it only holds the front tire. Um, but they are everywhere. There is bike parking everywhere. This is just a week night out. And again, this actually may have been in front of like an English academy because there's a lot of uh, kids' bikes here. Just some more bike parking. They have covered bike parking a ton of places, although some of these I kind of question how much they'd actually do much covering. But this is a typical... Sorry typical apartment complex you'll see this kind of parking this is actually a big box store which I would kind of say was their version of Walmart but they still have fantastic bike parking out front and plenty of people using it and then I just showed this because this was something I noticed so many people use these spring-loaded kickstands that are like this shape you know they go all the way around um, and so whether or not they're using racks this was a really common way and what people will do is park it like that and put the the lock through and then just leave it. Another thing, I don't think I said this already, one thing that was a, a real struggle was it's one thing to have a translator, but to have someone who speaks planning language and engineering language, I didn't have, and so there's a lot of questions that I left with unanswered. And so that's something to think about when you're traveling or when you're doing research is going into it knowing that you need someone who really does kind of speak the jargon. Because I would ask a question about mode share and had the planner, the bike planners understood what I was asking, they, that concept obviously they understand, but it was, we couldn't get to that because of the translation. So that's just, that was one of my few regrets of the trip is I didn't get to ask as many questions as I wanted to. Um, this is really typical of the downtown bike paths. Um, even though the bike's been around for a long time in Sanju, they were fairly active starting to do more bike facilities in like the early 90s, which I think is pretty similar to Portland, right? That's about the time frame. Um, most of theirs looks like this. It's the super wide, they, and they split the colorized, but there's no other thing that separates bikes and peds, so everyone intermixes, and I'll show some more pictures of that up ahead. Um, but really, really just wide sidewalks, so they're just side paths. And it's, it's interesting. I would compare it a little bit to living slalom if you're on your bike because you're kind of weaving around people but they make it work and I couldn't I'd like to know more about how how it does work so well and I don't know if it's just a slightly slower pace nobody's in as big a hurry as you see in a lot of American cities so everybody kind of just makes it work or just that's what they're always used to 
um, there you see some of the bikes getting knocked over. This is almost a private joke picture for people from Davis because we have such a big problem with yard waste. And I don't know, does, is Portland containerized their yard waste? Yeah. yeah. So Davis is one of the very few communities who doesn't, who still doesn't containerize yard waste. And so it's in the bike lanes and it's a huge problem and it's a big, been a big fight. But I had to show people back in Davis that even halfway around the world or probably around the world, they, they also have this problem. Um, here's a better picture of just the downtown path and how you know people might walk three, four, five abreast, and then this really cute little old lady was just she just went for it. She just kind of weaved on through, and then again here, and you'll see I didn't capture it in these, but you'll see a lot of like the stores will put out the sandwich boards and you know other things, and so it's 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 really kind of a interesting mix. Okay, so here's more of their separated what we would think of as a class one facility. Um, really, really nice, beautiful. They do colorize. They do some kind of um, colorized polymer uh, in the top layers. It almost feels like a high school track. It's got that springiness in it. And some of it's done with recycled rubber, which is cool. But this is, again, middle of the day um, on a weekday. And it was just mostly older people. This is, uh, in particular, let's see, in the next picture, this is all kind of in the same area. If you can see on here, there's a, a heart. And there's a big poster, and it, it has to do with like getting out and being active for health and everything. So they definitely have an active health promotion aspect to their their bicycle and pedestrian stuff. Um, this is this I took a picture of because in Davis we're having a lot of conversations right now about whether we want to try and use at least striping to separate our peds and bikes. Probably the number one call I get from bikes is complaints about pedestrians in their way on the path and the number one call I get from pedestrians is bikes on the paths and so we're looking at do we want to say okay walk on the outside bike on that but we can't paint everywhere because it's too expensive so this is kind of an ongoing conversation we're having and I and I just took this to show that you know they kind of just say every you know you walk right but you also bike right or like um, is it the Hawthorne Bridge is that the one where it's got it's got really nice separation and it totally works and they don't they don't do it the same way there again like I said urban pockets sprinkled throughout the city, um, separated by ag, and in between they have really beautiful paths, a beautiful path network. Again, the colorized, they switch between red and green. I couldn't get an answer on if there's any kind of rhyme or reason to that. Um, and then they use, on the ped area, they use, I, for lack of a better term, I thought it was a giraffe pattern, but it's just kind of a beautiful black and white paving. Um, this one I took to show because it's uh, one of the, uh, yet another danger of, of side paths and bike paths is, I lost my mouse again, oh, um, they have this beautiful path and it's fairly new and then they put this sign right in the middle of the path and the sign, if you can read it, says Sanju Bicycle Museum. <laughs> so, you know, real, real miscommunication there, so it's just one of those things. So, uh, I said I'd talk about Pohong a little bit. This is on the coast. It is there's a steel mill, or I don't even know if you're going to call it a mill. It's, it's the size of a small city. It's this incredible complex. And we got to tour it, but I couldn't take any pictures because it's like a multi-billion dollar industry and very proprietary. And, um, but one of the cool things about this huge steel complex is all through it, bike paths, and you'd see workers in their full gear biking between, you know, this thing's so spread out. Like I said, it's literally the size of a city, biking between the, the major parts of the facility, which I thought was cool and just couldn't take any pictures of. Um, but this is outside. If you were to spin, if you were to just pan to your right, you would see this massive steel complex city. But then, you know, you look this way, and it's, um, it's really beautiful. It's what a lot of people kind of think of when they think of parts of Korea or whatever with these lush mountains. But great totally cool path all along, um, ped and bike. I don't know about the, that's not a, a, a warping of the picture. It was actually kind of sinewy like that. And I don't know if that's just to slow people down, make it more recreational or what, but it was really cool. Lots of people, there's all, our kids were, went crazy getting out on the beach. It was great. Um, side paths, you know, they're getting a lot of att new attention, the cycle track, side path, and I'm not going to go into a lot, kind of just the, the details of you know, what makes each one what, but 
there's a lot of interest in it, but there's also a lot of problems with them or potential challenges. And this is, this is one of them. They have these beautiful paths. They're fairly new, but the, the businesses in particular on side don't necessarily look at them as a bike path. So like you see this tire shop is, and this, this is parked. They've you know, started to use it for their display. You can see farther on there's a car just parked. And I saw this all over the place. Um, this one is this, you look one dry, so we were at a dried persimmon auction. You look one way, beautiful path stretching out into the countryside, and you turn around and you've got a truck, you've got all these trucks. So it was just kind of an interesting mix of these beautiful facilities, but then there wasn't any kind of seeming enforcement or anything to try and keep them clear. Um, again, terrific facilities, clearly a lot of money invested, and because of the way that they were designed, people could just drive right up on them, and it just seemed like great, a great parking spot. Um, on the other hand, lots of the facilities were just gorgeous and they were, you know, treated as such. If you can see, these are actually bikes all along the railing. And again, we saw this all over the city. Lots of just little details about the bike. Um, finally, let's see. Um, this, I didn't get to explore this too much, but I did, we did spend a little time in Seoul on the way out. And I would highly recommend it if you haven't, ah, stop, there we go. Um, if you haven't been there. But I think it was about, well, Seoul, you know, it's a, it's a massive city. We're up on the 60th floor of the 63 building. It's a really famous building in, in Seoul. And the whole 60th floor is a viewing gallery, so you can walk around and look out. And as literally as far as the eye can see, it's high rises. I mean, it's just a m massive city. But the Han River flows through the middle of it. And I want to say like 20 years ago, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the date, they actually ripped out freeway that was running along the river. So this open spot here that you see was, they, they ripped that out and put in the most amazing urban park. And it goes for miles and miles along, along the river. And you have, there's like, this is kind of a high speed, what I would characterize as a high speed bikeway. So this is more like you could see people who look like they were commuting. They do have like, you know, the, the spandex clad helmet wearing. This is probably the only place in in my, on my trip, I saw that. Then they have the slower path. They have a lot of those, um, I think of them as like from the 80s, but they're quite popular in South Korea, the, the like exercise stations. So you have just the exercise equipment and you can stop on your walk and do some curls and everything like that. Um, and this, we went by there on a Wednesday in midday and this was just, there was, you can't tell from the pictures because it's so high, but there was thousands of people out using this just amazing urban park. And it went for miles along the river. I couldn't find a good statistic online to say exactly how long it stretches, but it was really cool. So I guess that's kind of the end. I kind of zoomed through that. But one of the things I think is interesting is how many good things they're doing there, and particularly the way that they have people who are riding that we don't have riding as much, different you know, kind of sectors of the community. But when you look at the, re at the literature, there's very little in the literature about Korea that I could find. I mean, I looked at TRB. I looked at... Um, different ITS, like the different UC ITSs, um, or the University of California Transportation Studies, things like that. And I just think that's kind of interesting, and I'm not sure why there's been such a lack, but I would highly encourage you if you're interested in, you know, certainly Asian studies or, or just um, kind of the uh, older transportation sector and things like that, and, you know, older people and bikes and health and bikes, I, you know, I really recommend looking into Korea and different parts of Asia, because I think there's a lot of room for research and a lot we can learn from them that isn't being done. So I, that was one of the cool things I kind of came away with. Um, so I think that was most of the stuff I wanted to cover. It was kind of fast. But um, this is just, these are some old guys who'd ridden their bikes down to the riverside to eat their lunch. And so we sat down and chatted them with them for a while. And they thought it was hilarious that we thought it was so cool that they rode their bikes to the river. <laughs> Or like we've been doing this every day for like 40 years, so. Um, but it was fun. So, yeah. Okay, let's just start in the back. You went up first there. So. Were you able to ask questions about how all these facilities were funded? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I should I should have talked about that. And I have, if you're interested, I can give you more information about some of the details on how much they've invested and things like that. Um, they, it, again, we had some language problems, but the way their government set up is a little bit different than us. So when they talk about the state. 
they actually mean like what we would consider the federal government. So a lot of it gets funded through there. So they actually have dedicated funding that they were able to use for a lot of this. Um, and then some of it comes from local funds that, that they were supposed to use on transportation that, that their leadership made the choice to spend on bike. So it wasn't like dedicated to bike ped. So it was very much like a political choice in San Juan City um, to use it for bike ped. But most of it ca came from the federal government. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I'll just keep going from the back forward, I guess, for now. Uh, you did a good job explaining sort of the chaos of, of, <laughs> of bikes and peds mixing together on their paths. Um, to manage some of that, were people using like bike bells a lot? I mean, how did That's they? That's a really good question. So I did not see or hear a bike bell. I did not see or hear on your left or any kind of thing that we think of. Um, again, because it is so congested in the downtown, there was it, nobody was like going too fast. Um, but they just kind of go for it. And that was another thing that was really interesting. And I was only there a week, so granted, this isn't like tons of observation, but um, I didn't see a single conflict. I didn't see, uh, you know, a bike slam on its brakes because a car was cutting in front of it. I didn't see bikes and peds really have any kind of major conflicts. And we spent a lot of time walking around or out on the bus or whatever, so I was out a lot. Um, and so that, that's what I mean. I don't, I can't answer the question of how they do make it work, but none of kind of the, the things that we think of, I never saw even though they tell the kids to signal. I'm not sure I ever saw anybody kind of really signal a turn or kind of do any of that. It's just, it's very much a kind of uh, fluid mix of, of people. So, yeah. I wish I had an answer, but go ahead. Just like, I'll get to you next. I, I lived in Seoul for a year. Oh, and cool. um, there, it, Seoul is a very different case, I think, because oh, there totally. aren't, there's the not nearly the same bicycle mode share, but there is a lot of conflict and they don't, like, bikes essentially can't be used on the, on, right. on street cycle paths. That being said, I was there last summer and they're putting in a lot more infrastructure, but there are a lot of conflicts and it doesn't work very well. Yeah, Seoul, totally different story. I mean, Seoul's much, you know, Seoul's a huge international city. Sanju City is, even though it's spread out, it's, it's more like a Davis. I mean, it's more like a town, so... Um, although Seoul is doing, I was reading recently in like Newsweek or something, Seoul is doing a lot of really cool things on just the larger picture of sustainability and trying to green their city, which I think is cool. But, uh, One thing on oh, yeah. that in particular, um, about what speed do you think the cyclists were going? Because I wonder if that factors into this at all. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, even on the side or on the kind of countryside path, I don't think people were going more than like 12 miles an hour. I mean, it was, it's a very kind of, it's much slower, you know, again, it, it, outside of Seoul, I didn't see a lot of people who look like what we can think of as bike commuters or people who are, you know, it's just, it's kids getting to and from and, and older people getting to and from market and, you know, church or wherever they're going. Um, so I'd say it's all, it's much slower. Yeah. Um, right here. Uh, so throughout this um, presentation, I was just thinking, um, you, you know, you had ended with the opportunity for more research in yep. Korea and places like Korea, and I and it just makes me think of um, I guess Robert Severo has done a lot of well at least a couple articles um, focusing on third world countries especially sure. and what we can learn from them and their transportation, um, you know challenges and opportunities there. So I guess you know I was just thinking uh, their goal, Sen Senju's goal of um, achieving a 50% mode share. Yeah. Um, you know, given that the times are changing and that the elderly continue to ride their bikes most likely because they grew up in third world Korea, you know, so that's, sure. that is all they know. Um, but as times are changing and things are becoming more modern, right. did you perceive that, you know, of course they're, you know, wanting this goal of 50% mode share, but did you hear that of any concern or, or real, like, you know, being, I don't yeah. know, just really, no, no, just I see what you're saying. It's a great question. I mean, you don't get the sense, certainly in Sanju, because it's so small, it wasn't like in some places where it, it felt like it was all, the youth are all about modernization and status and, you know, the next thing. Not, not that they're not into totally modern. And I mean, the schoolgirls here, I mean, the schoolgirls there and the schoolgirls here, it's, it was hard to tell the difference except for, you know, some of them have to wear uniforms. But on that, it, they're carrying the same things, they're interested in the same things. But it's a good, I don't know, I don't know, it'd be a, a question for them. I mean, it's a very ambitious mode share goal. Um, I think partly they're just, they're, it's, it's probably higher than 21%, and they just aren't measuring that yet. Um, and I think that would be interesting to look at kind of the cultural shifts 
and, and places maybe like Sanju where they're not as, they're not suffering as bad as, I'm sure in the cities it's probably, there's probably more pressure with kids to, you know, or, or the changing generations to kind of want a car ownership seems like the way they have to do it. And, but I think Sanju is a good example of a place that's actually can be quite spread out and still the bike functions very, very well there. So, yeah. Um, right here. <coughs> yeah, uh, it's a two-part question. Um, you showed like the younger generation, the student uh, students in schools, and you showed the elderly. But mm -hmm. um, like the the that portion in the middle, uh, how about those people? Are are they all riding bikes in the same I saw intensity? Virtually no people that were. I mean, I'd say there was a university there, and so there was some university age people on bikes but not a ton. They tended to be more pedestrian, it seemed like. Um, and then I saw virtually no people from age 30 to 50, 30 to 60. I mean, it was, it was really interesting. I mean, it was mark there was like a marked difference in ages where the people are at the two ends of the spectrum and like almost nobody in between. And that was not something that I think would be interesting to explore more about, you know, why, why that is, if it's just the, the way they're their work schedules are, or their work locations. I mean, that was just, you know, one of those questions that I didn't get a chance to ask or get answered. Um, the other part is, like, it's obvious that there is somebody behind directing the city to be mm -hmm. a, a, a cycle city or a bicycle city. Is that, um, like, when did that start? Did you get a historical Yeah, uh, I mean, so they, they really started in the, the 90s, between 90 and 95, and they have a full-time bike person now just like Roger Geller here, me and Davis. Um, I don't know how long the bike, there has been a dedicated bike person, but there has been. And then he also, his boss, part of his boss's time is solely on bike things. And so even though they have had biking for longer, most of like the facilities have been installed since then. And I think, I mean, a lot of the ones I showed have been probably in the last 10 years, more, more like, so, yeah. Michelle? Thank you. No, she's got it. Uh, what lessons did you learn that you think you'll be able to implement or take back to Davis and increase the mode share in Davis? Or do you think there are any? No, that's a good question. I think um, I really like the idea of, and this is not anything new, and certainly there's been interest in Davis for a long time, is doing more education and kind of these ideas of expanding the bicycle rodeos to something more where kids get like their own license. And, and things like that because it does you know certainly the more th that we can get it to be part of the lifestyle of young kids that they can carry that forward something we certainly have a problem with in Davis and I would guess it's pretty universal in the US is like you were kind of alluding to with the kids hit 16 and then it's like forget it like having a car you have to otherwise you're not cool and you can't you know get as far at lunchtime and you know all those kind of things and so I think we want to do a lot more of kind of what they're doing is focusing on educating kids. That's probably one of the bigger things. And then also, although I have no ideas yet on how we might actually implement it, is clearly older people can be riding. I mean, we need to make it more comfortable for them, you know, our, whether it's our facilities or the speed on our facilities or uh, our, the wayfinding on our facilities or whatever it is and we don't know yet. Um, clearly we could do be a better job about getting our older population riding and you know especially in Davis which is so small and it's so flat <laughs> um, you you know anybody should be like nearly anybody should be able to get around to you know work church friends grocery buy bike so there was one over yeah can we go back to the mode share goal they had? Did you get any idea of how they set that? Is it based on greenhouse gas emissions like we might have here? That's a good question. There wasn't a lot. You know, it's funny. So I was going to try and go back a few. Let's see. Um, what's funny is the, the bike planner and his boss gave me uh, a, a, a copy of their PowerPoint because we ended up not kind of doing presentations. We just sat and talked. Um, but it's entirely in Korean, and so I'm very slowly cutting and pasting it in Google Translator. <laughs> um, so it actually has, I wasn't able to do that before I came here, but um, it has some of these answers that I think, you know, and, and I'm happy to share that and, you know, sh put, you know, we can post that on the web and share that with whoever because they made it clear that that was for sharing. Um, but I think they kind of looked at the numbers that they have, and they're, they, they didn't talk, in the stuff I saw, 
they didn't talk as specifically about kind of emissions and they want to get from X to Y. It was more about we want to green our city, we want to be more sustainable. So it's kind of just more in the overarching idea of being a greener city. And that's just in the stuff that I've seen. But I don't, so they didn't say like, yeah, this is 50% will help us get to our 1990 level, you know, emission levels or anything like that. So, yeah. Um, back there. Um, you're talking about some of the uncertainty about how things work with pedestrians and bicyclists. I wonder, do you know, have any sense of what uh, fatalities or casualties on some of the system is? Yeah, and that's, that? no, that's a good, I mean, definitely, I would love to have those kind of numbers, but um, there's very, it's very f hard to find information online, partly because I don't know that they've been tracking it as long as, you know, some of the information we have here. Um, and that's something I'd like to follow up with them is what kind of, you know, particularly in the car, bike, and car ped uh, conflicts. I think that would be interesting, but no, I don't know. Um, let's see. Yeah. The 0.83 HH, is that per household? Yes, per household, it? sorry. Is there a definition of how many or not, what constitutes a household, four people, three people? Um, the typical household size, I want to say, like I think in here it's like 2.5 or something that I was reading, or at least, I mean, it depends where you are, but theirs is like 2.5 to 3 people per household. So I'd say that's a pretty good rough, uh, rough number. Uh, yeah. Are there any concerns about what's going to happen when the current non-riders, those say 30 to 60, when they age? Are, are there yeah, expectations that they're going to also suddenly pick up a bicycle? Or? Well, and that's, that I think is a good question because, like I said, when I asked about do you outreach to elderly people and they're like, what are you talking about? No, they just ride bikes. Um, I'm not sure how much thought is going into that demographic change. And so that would be something that I think it would be really interesting to work with them and say, look, is this something you're considering? And here's what we're seeing as our, as our I mean, because there was a really good article, I forget if it was the New York Times, about aging, the aging of the whole world population. And it talked about different countries. And, you know, it's so many, everybody, everybody's having this issue of, of an aging population, and, or almost everybody. Um, so that would be something that I think would be a very interesting case that could be studied is looking at th that 30 to 60 or whatever range now and then following them and seeing what happens and looking at what things are actively done to promote that group to continue to ride like the current older generation and what will happen without active promotion. So, yeah. I know I'm not answering a lot of questions, I'm just, but I'm agreeing that they're good questions. <laughs> Go ahead. How well developed is the transit system? Uh, what's the other 79% of mode share and is the bike infrastructure complementary to that? Yeah, that's, um, there's a lot of pedestrian activity in there, and then I'd say it's mostly auto. Um, they, do, they do have a bus system in Sanju, but it's not, I wouldn't consider it a transit city, and they don't, I mean, it's, again, Sanju is a very small city. <laughs> uh, not, and I'm sure Seoul, someone else here could talk about Seoul's transit, which is a whole different story, but um, I'd say that most of the rest of the, the mode share is pedestrian and automobile, and I don't know how that falls. So, yeah. Was that, that yeah. Um, all right. Um, does bicycling have a stigma associated with it? So my understanding is that, like, yeah, this older generation that bikes a lot, they live their entire lives depending on that mode for transportation. Um, do you think that the current middle-aged population sees bicycling as something that um, like poor people have to depend on so like they are able to up and buy a, a car now so they use that do you think that has anything to do with this uh, mode share being limited to the very young and the very old yeah I mean it's a good question that comes back to kind of these issues of what role status or modern you know kind of modernity plays and that's something I, I don't know a lot about in them and we we had very little chance to interact kind of with that except for with the business people and the you know kind of the local administrators that we were with and they all drove they all but they were kind of the I don't want to say high power businessmen but they were you know they were kind of the local dignitaries and businessmen and and so they all drove but at the same time some of them are the ones who are working on getting everyone else biking which I think is really common it's kind of like you know transit's great I want someone else to ride it kind of attitude and I think that, that may be true there. And I don't know if th for there it's as much of an income issue 
or just like that's what the older people do and then if you're a kid you ride a bike um, so I don't I don't know how much um, kind of the income role plays versus just like the age thing so yeah um, let's see uh, let's go with you since you haven't got to ask a good question black shirt and then we'll do pink shirt sorry I don't does that microphone work or do you need this one? Yeah, this one works. So um, I actually walked in a few minutes late, so if you covered this, I apologize. But um, do, do you know anything about the differences in property rights law between us and there? I know, because you showed a lot of pictures of off-street bike paths, and with like the spring water and the Fano Creek Trail here in Portland, there's been big land use legal battles over extending bike paths. So I was wondering if there was some sort of difference. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean. All the paths, pretty much all the paths I shows are part of the right of way that's owned by the local city. So there wasn't really, it wasn't, it wasn't like paths that cut through the big swaths of agriculture. They all go along the road. So that didn't really come up in any conversations. Yeah. Um, pink shirt. Thanks. Um, I just wondered if you knew anything about how they were going to try to get to the mode share goal. And it seems like there's that's a big jump in yeah no what, it's two years three years from yeah now. no it's huge so they're kind of doing um, like I think any of us the kind of multi pronged thing they're continuing to put in new facilities and then these you know kind of promotion events with the kids in particular and the driving because that you know I said forty five hundred people have gone through it I think that's only been around a couple years so that's a fairly new thing again they're pushing that to try and increase um, bicycling and then. They see, you know, the Bicycle Museum and some of these other... Oh, and I didn't even mention this. They have a bicycle festival. They have a national bicycle festival, which is in the beginning of October, so we missed that. But again, just kind of, you know, very much, probably much more like Portland than Davis even, with just really promoting this, the whole civic identity of the bicycle and just making people excited about the bicycle. So it's kind of that facilities and then um, encouragement activities. And one thing that we didn't talk about, about at all again with the language barrier was disincentives like are they using disincentives about there's not really any god I'm trying to think again it's hard because I couldn't read the signs but there there didn't seem to be a lot of parking restrictions or parking pricing at least in Sanju again this is all you know I'm not talking about Seoul at all that's a different different thing but um, so they didn't seem to have a lot of disincentives like that except for the fact that it is a compact urban area and so there's not a lot of parking so things like that so they seemed very focused on kind of the encouragement activities but again that's who I was working with was the bike planners and people are doing the encouragement activities and maybe you know there may be other people who are kind of working on some of the more disincentives yeah but I think it was more focused on building new facilities and just encouraging uh, encouragement activities so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the elderly and their bike usage. You mm -hmm. already mentioned like the exercise stations, and I know in Seoul those are really popular with old people. Yeah. And um, it seems like Korea has a very like very long life expectancy and a very high quality of life mm -hmm. to a very high age. So how, talking in an American context, how can we also help our elderly people to be fit enough to ride bikes and to ride their bikes down to the riverfront to like. Use yeah. an exercise station. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I think I don't like kind of gerontology and that type of stuff is definitely not my field, so I don't want to say too much about that, about what I don't know. Um, but I, I do think some of it is just working on perception um, and also maybe, you know, encouragement activities in, in centers that seniors already attend, like the senior center, community centers. For instance, Davis, you think, would be a perfect place. We have one senior center. <laughs> Um, that we could do some activities where we're doing an adult ride a bicycle class. It's very possible that the, the seniors there are fit enough, but they haven't been on a bike since they were 10. And there's a big fear issue. I mean, I get calls from middle-aged people who say, do you have an adult biking class? And you guys may have those here. We don't have them currently. Um, so I think even just starting to reach the people who are close you know, and then working at how do we reach people. And again, like I said, our facilities, how we design our facilities, I think is really important um, because I think people will feel more comfortable with nicer facilities, wider facilities where they don't feel as crowded. And then also taking into account, and this is something I've been thinking about more recently, is using more like the, the um, three-wheeled bikes, like tricycles, that make it more available to more people, but then you have to have facilities that are, you know, can account for that. So if you have really tight facilities, people aren't going to feel comfortable 
out on a three-wheel bike that's wider. You know, something that we're trying to get rid of in Davis is the use of bollards as much as possible. They were used, everybody familiar with what a bollard is? It's a pole, locks cars, often from driving up onto the bike path. Um, but they were just kind of used so liberally and the spacing is so tight that it can be quite difficult to get through places. I was riding, I don't usually ride a trike, and I was riding one and I rammed right into it because I forgot that I was wide in the back, you know? So it's like things like that where just, it's not a big issue, it's not an expensive issue, but it's just a design issue is how do we take into account. So that would be another way I'd say reaching out um, to the population. One thing that local churches have done, um, churches around the country have done is the, um, what do they call it, holy rollers? So they'll have like a bike to work, I mean bike to work, bike to church event. And so encouraging like their congregations and that's, you know, just so those kind of things. There's, I think there's a lot of room for those kind of activities. So. Okay, so I'm going to, we're right at about our time. Uh, before we um, thank uh, Tara, I do want to put our plug in for next week's speaker. Um, a little bit of a contrast. We'll have Jenny Liu, who's a, a visiting um, faculty member in, I think visiting, hopefully I have that right, maybe, maybe not. Uh, anyway, she's with our economics department um, at Portland, here at Portland State University. She'll be talking about household vehicle choice from an adoption perspective. So hopefully we'll see a few of you um, next week. And thank you very much, Tara, thank you. for joining us. Thank you.